You know, there's um, a point in the life of every honest man before he becomes honest when you realize you're not really honest, you're not really authentic. Um, it is a process of uh, being renewed, being awakened. There's a verse of scripture that says, awake sleeper, or awake dear sleeping brother. Arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. This book, Where the Light Fell, is precisely about that. And there's a time in Philip Yancey's life when he realizes that a lot of other people around him seem to have a better life going, uh, seem to be more honest, seem to be more authentic. And um, he decides that he's going to become an authentic person and writes this line on page 179. He says, I am trying to become an authentic person artificially. <laughs> would, you, would you please welcome Philip Yancey. Thank you, and it's great to be here. We, we got out of Evergreen, Colorado just in time yesterday, expecting about a foot of snow in our hometown. And as the clouds drifted down this way, it warmed up, and now we're getting it in the form of rain, which you guys can cope with. So it works out. It's, and I'm going to be at St. Bartholomew's. Anybody here from St. Bart's? A few of you. OK, yeah. Tomorrow night, that's Friday night, and Saturday morning, you're welcome to come, if you like. Uh, as soon as they scheduled me, the vicar resigned and moved to New York City, so <laughs> they're not sure anybody's going to show up, so they, we really like you there, actually. Uh, I'm sure their website has details. I am going to talk about this book, Wes, and I have a paperback edition. You say, where'd you get a paperback? Well, it's one of those advanced deals that they send to reviewers and places, so you can't get one. Page numbers don't work. There are few errors in it, but it's easier to carry around and weighs less in the suitcase. But we do still have a few books left. As Wes mentioned earlier, it's a $28 book, and publishers hate me when I do this because then it shows how much they mark it up. So I can get them for $12, and we're just passing that along to you. So if you want one, you can, you can get one. And I wrote it because I had never really told my story before. I'd never really put it together for myself. And I've learned that as a reporter, as an investigative journalist, I've learned over the years that everybody has a story. Um, Buddy Green has a story. Wes Yoder has a story. And they told me, that, but they said if I tell you, they'd have to kill me, but, uh, so I can't tell you their story, but I, I, I've learned that everybody does. And a memoir is kind of like a verbal selfie. You just hold your phone up and try to put together your own life, and that's what I've been doing for the last few years. In a sense, the only thing any writer has is a unique perspective. My view of the world is shaped by my church, by my family, by my growing up, by my teachers, as yours is. So we can look at exactly the same thing, but you see something different than I do, because you're not me. And, and that's all I've got to offer, a unique perspective. And I've written books for 40 years now, I've written about 25 books. They're all kind of idea-driven essay type books. I call them personal pilgrimage. And they're my ways of struggling with faith. Where is God when it hurts? And what happens when you're disappointed with God? And does prayer really work? And who is Jesus if he's not the person that I was taught growing up? These are the questions that I've spent my life. And I feel privileged looking back that I had the ability to devote the kind of time. We all have those questions. But a lot of people have real jobs. <laughs> and I don't. So, you know, we think about these... We think about these questions at night and on weekends or when the preacher's preaching, but I think about them all day long. I said, that is my job, just alone in my office, and I can go to people who can help me figure out things that I can't figure out on my own. So I wanted to capture this moment in time. You could look back and say, evangelicalism is, is one of the dominant characteristics of the years we moved in, lived in, but it's changing a lot. Even today, about 100 million Americans will classify themselves as evangelicals, if they're given a list. 100 million of them, almost a third, 
we'll classify. And we share certain things in common. We went to summer camps, we went to Young Life clubs, we went to New Canaan Society meetings. I mean, this is part of the subculture, right? Uh, we, we know about World Vision, we know about Billy Graham. These are things that we all hold in common. But things are very changing. About 30 million people can be classified as ex-evangelicals, ex-evangelicals. Because we used to be seen as kind of the center of American culture, and American culture has changed a lot and is still changing. And I heard somebody say the other day, you know, it used to be that people thought of Christians as the home team. Now they're the visiting team. They're the ones you throw the beer cans at, you know. They're trying to ruin my good time. They're trying to tell me what to do. I don't like these Christians. They're too stuffy. They're self-righteous. They're hypocritical. You know, we hear all that. And you've probably seen the charts of young people particularly. About a third of them classify themselves as nuns, not, not the kind who wear black and white habits, but N-O-N-E-S. When they ask them, what's your religious preference, Buddhist, Hindu, uh, you know, Christian, whatever, they say none, about a third. Some of them are your children, grandchildren. So the culture is changing a lot, and I wanted to capture it before it changed. If you read the New York Times, all you would know about evangelicals is that a lot of them voted for Donald Trump. I mean, it's seen through a political lens. They don't know anything really about why we are meeting here together and what we hold in common and why there is some, something like the New Canaan Society. All they see is voter blocks, and they see evangelicals as part of one particular voter, voter block, largely. The reason I decided to write this book is because I realized at some point that I was given a gift. The gift was a remarkably screwed up life. <laughs> and if you're a writer, that is a gift. So it started with my family. When you're a kid growing up, you just assume everybody's like you, every family's like yours, and then you realize, wait a minute, they're not like me. And it took me a while to figure this out, but when I did, I started taking notes. Uh, I used to hate these family reunions because family members were crazy. I mean, everybody's got a few crazy members. I don't have any sane members in my family. <laughs> And when I'm in small groups sometime, I'll say, tell me about the craziest person in your family. And it never goes further than cousin or uncle or aunt, you know? I mean, we all have these people. Well, I was surrounded by these people. And I used to think, oh, no, I can't believe i got to be around Uncle Jimmy and Uncle Bob again. But then I realized, this is material for a writer. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. And so I would keep a little note card in my pocket and I would memorize these mnemonic devices where, you know, I try to remember everything they said. And then I would run to the bathroom and I'd write down everything before I forgot it. So my family thinks I have perpetual diarrhea because I'm always, <laughs> I'm always in the bathroom writing down their comments. <laughs> and then finally I got to use them in this, in this memoir. So I, I had this crazy family. I, had, uh, I, I lived at a tumultuous time, the 1960s. We were becoming aware of poverty and, and world events. There was a war going on. There were protests in the streets. There was a civil rights movement. There were divisions in our country. Sound familiar? Yeah. I mean, we thought we had worked through some of that stuff in the 1960s, and here we are going through it again. But, uh, but that was my formative time. I was in high school, graduated in 1966, so right smack in the middle, and in college when they were taking college presidents hostage and bombing student union buildings, things like that. And then I was also a part of a, a, an extreme church, not, a, not an evangelical church, but a fundamentalist church. On the map, you know, the, over here would be uh, Union Theological Seminary, in the middle of it would be Wheaton College, on the right would be Bob Jones University, and this is where I was. <laughs> And I'm not kidding you, my, my pastor was, that was teaching doctrinaire racism from the pulpit, he called Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Lucifer King, Kuhn, Martin Lucifer Kuhn. And, and the church, and this was one of the better churches, the church printed up a card to give to people of color who tried to enter that church saying, we know you're not a sincere worshiper of God, you're just a troublemaker, you're not welcome here. 
But if you want to know more about Jesus, call this number. <laughs> it's, it's called uh, offensive evangelism, I guess. But. And that church softened over the years, and, and then they finally got to where they would allow African Americans to come to the church, but they wouldn't allow them to join. So there was one raucous meeting with the whole church, and, and this one Bible college student, he went to Carver Bible College in Atlanta, where I grew up, applied for membership, and they debated and debated, and then I remember the deacon angrily pounding down the gavel, and it was unanimous that he would be not allowed his name was Tony Evans. He runs a 10,000 member church in Dallas, Texas right now. So that was my church. Bob Jones, us. <laughs> and what happened to me, when, again, when you're a kid, you believe everything the adults tell you. And you, you assume that people of color are inferior, cursed by God, because we were taught that from the pulpit. And then every once in a while, a little alarm goes off, ding, 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 ding. They were wrong. They lied to me. And this was a huge crisis of faith for me in high school because I got a summer fellowship at the Center for Disease Control. It's called the Community Disease Center back then. And when I walked in, I knew I was going to be reporting to an Ivy League PhD in biochemistry, a very impressive man. I was going to work with him all summer. And I walked in, opened this door, and it was a black man. And those alarm bells went off. My church lied to me. They were wrong. They told me you could never be a person of color and, and, and become like that, or become president of the United States. We know that to be wrong now. And that was a huge crisis of faith, because if they were wrong about race, maybe they were wrong about Jesus. Maybe they were wrong about the Bible. And what I learned, I learned early on, was not everyone who says they speak for God actually does. Not everyone who says they speak for God actually does. There was an underlying plot line in my family, and it went like this. Uh, there, were there were four of us, my father, mother, and two boys. My br brother was two years older. My mother and father, mother grew up in Philadelphia. The father grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. And he was a sailor at the very end of World War II. In fact, he was steaming his way to Hawaii to fight the Japanese when the atomic bomb dropped. The war was over, and they just turned the ship around and went back and you know, kind of sat on their, on their hands for months until they could get out. And he was based in Norfolk and went on a Sunday to see Philadelphia, the sights of Philadelphia. And he went to church, and the pastor said, invite a sailor home for church. And somebody did, and he fell in love with my mother, and the rest is history. So they got married, and they were devout. He wanted to be, she wanted to be a missionary in Africa, and, and he did as well, finally. And they were successful. He had a whole string of people that he had led to Christ. He, they raised support. They had a mailing list of several thousand people who were going to give them money and pray for them. And they had a pandemic back then, too. It was polio. Polio mostly struck children, but occasionally an adult like Franklin Delano Roosevelt would come down with polio. My father was one of the unlucky ones. He was 23 on his way to the mission field, and suddenly overnight, he couldn't move a muscle in his body. He couldn't even breathe on his own. His, his lungs didn't work. They were paralyzed. So he was put in an iron lung, this machine that had bellows that they sucked air in, in and out, creating a vacuum, forcing his lungs to breathe. He was in there for two months. And some Christians, these are people who loved him, who cared for him, who were going to support him. Some Christians believed that he would be healed. Why would God take a 23-year-old person with such potential as a missionary in Africa and just remove him from the planet? And I didn't find this part of the story out. Of course, I knew my father had died. I was just a year old when my father died, so I have no conscious memories of him. I, really had no father. And when I was 18 years old, I found a clipping from the Atlanta Journal about this apparent healing where my father was removed from an iron lung against all medical advice because people believed that he would be healed by God. And so they removed him. And he did show, he thought some improvement. Maybe he was able to move his toe a little bit. 
He was certainly more comfortable out of the iron lung. And I looked at the date of the newspaper, and it was nine days before he died. Not everybody who speaks from God, for God, really does. These were not evil people. These were people who loved him, who cared for him. They made a theological error. They took on a prerogative they didn't have. And that started making me question everybody who speaks for God. And in a sense, I've been doing that ever since. I learned, I learned that the best intentions of people can turn into the worst results. My mother, who participated in that decision um, more than anyone, who had more at stake than anyone, of course, was crushed. She was unready to face life. She lost her husband. She had gambled. She had believed God, but you can't get mad at God, so who do you get mad at? How do, you, how do you come to terms with that, the guilt? The... So she, she did something. It's my least favorite story in the Bible. You know the story where Hannah brings her son Samuel to the temple and gives him to the priest and says, I've wanted a child. I finally have a child, so I'll give it to you, God. And that's what she did with my brother and me. They, we must replace our father as missionaries in Africa, that specific. And that seemed kind of noble at first. She told us that when we were kids. And that seemed, well, that's nice. But, you know, we didn't, we were kids. We were teenagers. And we didn't turn out the way she thought we should turn out. And she became more shrill and more unbalanced. And I'll read you a story that explains some of that. If I ever find it. In one of my science books, a naturalist stumbles upon a bird and a serpent entwined in a dance of death. A large black snake has looped itself around the body of a hen pheasant, pinioning her wings so that she cannot fly away. The bird makes a series of leaps several feet in the air, and with each crashing descent, she pounds the snake's body against the stony desert ground. Hissing in fury, the snake does not let go, but uses each leap to tighten its grip around the hen. As I read that passage, I picture not a bird and a snake, but my brother and mother locked in a deadly embrace. During my high school years, as I retreated into a defensive shell at home, Marshall confronted God and mother head on. Then comes one of those pivotal days that begins like any other but alters a life forever. I return home from my job on a catering truck to find Marshall sitting at the kitchen table going through the day's mail. He looks up, waves an opened envelope, and grins like he's just won the lottery. You won't believe it, he crows. Not only did they accept me, they're offering me a scholarship. My brother was preternaturally gifted as a musician, and he had just applied to Wheaton College because they had a conservatory of music. Hey, congratulations, I say. You got your number one choice. I hear Wheaton's a great school, and it's Christian. Surely mother won't object. I couldn't be more wrong. That evening, the three of us eat dinner around the dining room table. Marshall says little as I describe my day's adventure on the route. I can tell he's churning inside. Just as we finish eating, Marshall brings up the letter. So um, I, I got some good news today, he says in a nervous voice. Wheaton uh, accepted me and gave me financial aid. Mother reacts quickly as if she's mentally rehearsed this discussion. She knew he was looking to transfer somewhere, and he'd mentioned Wheaton in passing. I'd rather you go to some place like Harvard, she says in a low, gruff voice, pronouncing the name with contempt. There, they don't even pretend to believe in God. Wheaton claims to, but they're liberal. They use the same words we do, but they don't really mean them. They're apostate, son. You're as likely to lose your faith there as at any secular university, probably more likely. Marshall takes the bait. Get serious. Wheaton's a Christian college. It's just not as narrow-minded as some others. Didn't Billy Graham attend there? Wrong answer. <laughs> Her voice rises. Yeah, look at him, inviting liberals and Catholics onto his platform, meeting with the Pope. 
talking about someday visiting Russia. That's exactly what I mean. Sensing a storm, I retreat to a sofa to watch the two of them spat. Mother's eyes contract, and her face contorts into a fierce, wild look that I have never seen before. She spits out the words, let me tell you something, son. Nobody's going to drive you to Wheaton. You're not yet 21, and in this state, that makes you a minor. Mrs. Barnes from church works for a federal judge. I'll get him to slap a warrant for kidnapping charges on anybody who carries you across state lines. She pauses, staring him down. You think I'm kidding? I'll do it. Just try me. Marshall does not yield. Then I'll fly. What's he going to do? Issue a warrant against Delta Airlines? Silence descends as mother contemplates the next threat. Her jaw tendon twitches faster, though her facial expression does not change. When she speaks, the words come in a burst of fury. Make fun of me if you want. I'll do whatever it takes to stop you, young man. You listen to me. If you find a way to pull off this plan, I guarantee you one thing. I'll pray every day for the rest of your life that God will break you. Maybe you'll be in a terrible accident and die. That'll teach you. Or better yet, maybe you'll be paralyzed. Then you'll have to lie on your back and stare at the ceiling and realize what a rebellious thing you've done, going against God's will and everything you've been brought up to believe. Her words hang in the room like a cloud of poison gas. Once released, it cannot be put back in the canister. Marshall pushes away from the table, scraping his chair so hard it leaves marks on the floor. He heads toward his bedroom, and a few seconds later, I hear the slam of a door. I keep my head down, pretending to read a magazine. My vision blurs, and a quickened pulse throbs in my temples. Be still, my heart, is the only thought I can form. In the tense quiet that follows, I picture my father lying motionless in an iron lung, staring at fluorescent lights overhead. I'll pray every day that God will break you. She would pray for that. Dozens, scores of times in ensuing years, my brother and I have replayed that scene together. We recall the same vivid details, the prominent W on the acceptance letter lying atop a pile of junk mail, the cold, hard words coming from a face twisted in rage. Yet we always disagree about one crucial point, what our mother actually said after the words, Better yet, I remember the threat of paralysis while Marshall remembers a different version. Or better yet, maybe you'll lose your mind. Those words embedded in him ever after, like barbed wire pressing into a tree's heartwood. To this day, I believe my brother's subconscious has backfilled his memory of her threat with what actually happened at Wheaton. Because while there, he, was, he dropped out his final semester and was diagnosed chronic paranoid schizophrenic. And he went on a, his own odyssey, trying to get as far away from the background we were raised as possible. He succeeded. He became one of Atlanta's first hippies, taking a lot of LSD, hanging out in Piedmont Park, watching the clouds drift overhead, turning colors, and fried his brain. He should have been a concert pianist that you would go to a concert hall to listen to instead. He became a piano tuner playing the same notes over and over. He became addicted. You know, addictions are powerful things. They promise everything at the beginning, and at the end they deliver nothing, but they cost everything. And he went through that whole saga. So I watched my brother, two years older, trying to get as far away from the subculture we were raised in as possible. And he succeeded, but eventually his freedom turned into a kind of slavery. He had one addiction after another, sex, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes. He gave me a, a, a question that, that haunts me every time I write a book. He says, how can you tell the fake from the real? When you grow up in a church environment, especially in high school years, we actually lived on a church property. We lived in a trailer, eight feet wide, 48 feet long, three of us and a piano, on a church property. So we were there every time the doors opened and every time the tent came, always we had to be there. 
And we learned how to give testimonies. We learned how to pray to make people cry. We learned how to be camper the week one week and get kicked out the next week. You know, we learned how to do that kind of stuff. My brother would say, how do you tell the fake from the real? And I, I struggled with that myself because I had gone forward a dozen times more to receive Jesus as my personal Savior. I had given testimonies. I had won the camper of the week. I had been kicked out of the camps. I, how do you tell the fake from the weird, real? I knew the performance. I knew what you had to do, the authentic that you were talking about, Wes. But I didn't know what was authentic. And I, you hear stories. You, we all have stories, and some of you have stories of, I was saved from alcohol, I was saved from drugs, and I was saved from a lousy church. <laughs> How would God break through to me? I grew up thinking he was that bully God who just enjoys smashing people, making them paralyzed, making them lose their mind. I'll show them. I didn't know the other side of God. I didn't know the grace that Buddy was singing about. The name of this book is Where the Light Fell, and it's a quote from St. Augustine. St. Augustine said, I couldn't look at the sun directly. It was too bright. I couldn't look at the sun directly either. It had scorched me. There's no way a tract by Billy Graham, a verse from the Bible, anything religious could reach me because I, I, I knew what came with that, the toxic part that came with that. And I went to a Bible college of all places, and I enjoyed my role there as a renegade, as an apostate, as the one who would sit in the open patio reading Why I Am Not a Christian by Bertrand Russell just to appall my friends who would pray for me, try to cast the demons out of me. And there in that place, the light began to fall. It fell in three ways for me. The beauties of nature. Nature was always my place of solace. When the trailer got too hot, too hot in every sense, <laughs> too loud, I would leave and go into the woods and dig in old rotten logs and find beetles and butterflies, and nature was my place. Classical music, my brother was gifted in ways that I can't even imagine, but I could at least play. And again, I would go in that Bible college chapel, sneak out, climb out my window, go in the middle of the night, and they had a nine-foot sine way in the chapel, and with a little light on the piano, I would sit there and, and play Brahms and Schubert and Beethoven. And it was beautiful in spite of myself, in spite of all the missed notes. And then romantic love. Those were the, the ways in which I experienced God's goodness, God's mercy. And we all have those. We live in a beautiful world. We live in the midst of common grace. And some people recognize it and some people don't. But I was in such a tight, resistant, defensive shell there's no way that God could break me in, in the way that, and, and I learned God doesn't do that. God loves, God woos. And there was a quote from G.K. Chesterton that brought me up short. He said, the worst moment for an atheist is when he feels a profound sense of gratitude and has no one to thank. <laughs> and that's how I felt. I realized that the church had lied to me about God. In the world, the world was a smiling place. In the heart of the universe is a smile, not a frown. It's the love of God. And I experienced that by seeing where the light fell. I learned that God is not in the perfection business. God is in the redemption business. I learned that if you look at the people in the Bible, God seems to prefer the renegades. I mean, look at, look, at, look at the heroes. Jacob, the cheating brother, not Esau, the good citizen. The, the prodigal son, not the obedient elder brother. Moses, the murderer. David, the murderer and adulterer. Paul, the human rights abuser. Peter, the denier, the betrayer, just like Judas. These are the heroes. These are the ones, the story. These are the story of the Bible. It's not a story of perfect people. It's a story of deeply flawed, imperfect people and a God who loves us anyway. That's the story of the Bible. And I hope that's your story, too. We all have a different story. Yours is different than mine. I don't know it. And I can't tell you buddies and Wes's. <laughs>
But I know that the story God wants to write in every one of our lives is that story of redemption. God is the great recycler. He takes the stuff that we want to just throw away and somehow out of it, as Paul said, takes that manure. <laughs> Paul used a stronger word. <laughs> takes that manure and, and creates out of it a, a work of art. That's the God we serve, the redeeming God who uses God's amazing grace to somehow recycle good out of people like us. Thank you.